Okay, that's excellent. Let's start please with number one. We're on page 133, I believe. Okay, Haley. Distinguish between rotation and revolution. Rotation is the spin motion of an object close does when rotating on the axis. And revolution is motion of an object turning around on the axis. Good. So rotation is the spinning about an internal axis, and revolution is spinning about an external axis is the easiest way to talk about that. Okay. Um, Taylor, next one, please. Does a child on a merry-go-round revolve or rotate around a merry-go-round's axis? They revolve about the merry-go-round's axis and circle. Good, good. Because the merry-go-round's axis is in one location, the child is outside of that, right? We could even consider um, if the child were in the very middle of the merry-go-round, we might consider that rotation, right? The, the child will be rotating about their own axis, but the merry-go-round would be causing the rotation. Okay, um, next. Distinguish between linear speed and rotational speed. Linear speed is the distance from each point and of time. Rotational speed is the number of rotations per minute. Right. So they both are per time. Linear speed is when it's a straight distance per unit, like a, a, a linear distance unit, meters or miles or whatever, per unit time. And rotational is when it's a number of rotations or revolutions per unit time. Okay. When you roll a cylinder across the surface, it follows a straight line path. It tapered. Tapered, meaning like it's thinner on one end than the other. Cup rolled on the same surface follows a circular path. Right, they have different diameters. One end of the cup has a different diameter from the other, and so they rotate a different, well, they rotate at the same rate, but one of them has a larger diameter, and therefore its linear velocity is different. Good. Okay. Does the force that holds the riders on the carnivore ride in figure 9.1 act toward or away from the center? I put toward the center. Toward the center. And we don't even have to look at the diagram because all forces that hold something in circular motion act toward the center. And that specific force is called the, actually, I'm sorry, that general force is called the centripetal, centripetal right? Mm -hmm. The P. Not to be confused with centrifugal, which ain't even a real force. Next. Okay. Inward force or outward force act on the clothes during the spin cycle of an automatic motion. That's okay, do it anyway. Oh, okay. We're having fun. Inward. inward force, it must be inward, right? It must be inward. Why then, Haley, does it seem like the clothes, like why is it working that the water can spin out of the cylinder? That's how a washing machine works, right? It has those holes so that the water can spin out but the clothes can't. So how come if an inward force is acting on them, the water is spinning out? Um, because the, um, since it's on the outer edge, the I'm looking for one word. The you're thinking of centrifugal, but that's a that's a false force. So what one thing is making so the water does fly out? The water is what? Inertia. The inertia of the water, right? Because at every given second, the water would be following a straight line path away from it. Um, and the only thing keeping the clothes in is the centripetal force provided by, it's a, it's a normal force provided by the drum of the washing machine, right? And the water doesn't have that because there's holes. Good. Um, and I got all fired up. I can't remember where we are. 11, I believe, right? When a car makes a turn, do seatbelts provide you with centripetal force or centrifugal force? And I say centripetal. Good. Centripetal is correct. I hope these, like, all, half of these questions we've done so far are trying to drill into your head the difference between the centripetal force, which is pulling in and actually exists, versus the centrifugal force, which is kind of like a feeling as opposed to a force, right? And that's, so hopefully, and I, you've answered them all right, so I have confidence that you're getting them correct, but you do understand the difference between those two things. Good. If the string that holds a whirling can in its circular path breaks, what causes the can to move in a straight line path? Centripetal force, centrifugal force, or a lack of force? I said a lack of force. A lack of force, which we can phrase another way. If no force is acting, on an object, the only thing it has is its inertia. Inertia for this chapter, it's kind of like the supreme answer, right? Like inertia just kind of seems to be the answer for everything. And and the reason for that is that we're trying, just like the book is trying, we're trying really hard to make it clear that when we feel a centrifugal force, right, that's a feeling because of our inertia, right? 
what's making us feel like we're being pulled out of the circle is inertia. Go. And what law of physics supports your answer in this if Newton's first law? Newton's first law. Okay. Next. Which one was that? Was that 12? Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. Okay. 15. Yes. Why is the centrifugal force the way that feels in a rotating frame called a fictitious? What's fictitious mean? Not, Not real, right? In the same way that like a fiction book is made up by someone. Okay, sorry, go ahead. Uh, because only gravity kind of is what, what the ladybug feels, even though there's no gravitational force in the thing. Right, so why... Why is that force, the centrifugal force that the ladybug does feel, why is that not a real force? One way you can think about it is that it violates one of the laws of physics. What, is it, what does it violate? If we're thinking about the centrifugal force, the pulling out of the ladybug, is there a reaction to that action? No. And therefore it violates what? If there's no reaction, it violates Newton's third law. And therefore it's a fictitious force. Because it's not a real force. Once again, it's a lack of force. It's inertia is what's making that ladybug feel that way. I don't know how I don't know if ladybugs can feel, but you know what I mean, right? Like the 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 action of the ladybug flying out from the circle is caused not by a force, but by a, a lack of force, right? There's nothing holding it in. If there's no centrifugal force holding it in, it flies out naturally because things move in a straight line unless acted upon by an outside force. Next question. Um, for a rotating space habitat of a given size, what is the relationship between the magnitude of stimulated gravity and habitat Um I was going to, the magnitude of stimulated gravity is directly proportional to the square of the rotation. It's the square, yeah. So omega, the rotational speed squared, is proportional to the simulated gravity. Simulated means like uh, kind of like pretend, like it's pretend gravity, right? Whereas stimulated means all jacked up. Okay, um, moving on to the next page. I think I explain, right? Number one. If you lose your grip on a rapidly spinning merry-go-round and fall off, in which direction will you fall? And it said straight from when you hold one. Good. Three. And we call that, there's a special name for that line. The, the tangent line. You would fly off in a straight line, like you said, but we have a special vocab word, which is that that's called the tangent line. Um, which state in the United States has the greatest tangential speed as the so think about you're looking at planet Earth from the top, right? That's how it spins. We're looking at it as a like it like as a record player. We're looking at it from the top. Which one nearer to what they would have greater tangential speed? Like the ladybugs in our example yesterday. It would be Hawaii because it's nearest the what? Equator. Right? The equator for us looking down at the earth, the outside of the earth. The outside of that circle we were looking down on would be the equator. And so whichever state were nearest the equator would have the greatest tangential speed. Which one would have the greatest rotational speed? That's the answer you're looking for before. Which one has the greatest rotational speed? They all have equal rotational speed. Because rotational speed for that would be um, one revolution per day. Or sorry, ro one rotation per day, right? And all of them have one rotation per day. Um, but the one with the greatest tangential speed would be Hawaii. So... Why do the Hawaiians not fly off that many meters per second that we did on the bell work? Why is that not the case? Because of gravity. Gravity holds them on the planet Earth's surface, yeah, so that's part of it. But how come they don't notice the change in speed? Because they're too small. Like, mm. We wouldn't feel it. We don't feel it, you're right, but why? It's not a large enough force. No, it is. It's very large. But it, what, think about it this way. Um, all of our motion is relative right so when we're talking about a car going 60 miles an hour down the highway that's relative to the highway um if you're in a car going 60 miles an hour and you pass a car going 55 your relative motion of that car is only five miles an hour right in the same way all the hawaiians and the palm trees and the hotels and the sand on the beach all of that stuff is moving the same speed as everything else right so it, there's no relative motion everything's moving the same speed even though it is moving very quickly just even more quickly than things here they, it's not noticed because everything in that location is moving at that same speed, right? Motion has to be relative. That was kind of, I got off kind of on a tangent, right? I got carried away thinking about talking about something else other than our circular discussion. Let's move on to the next one. A motorcyclist is able to ride on the vertical wall of a bowl-shaped track as jump. 
Does centripetal force or centrifugal force act on the motorcycle? Depends. I'll put the centripetal force because the motorcycle is central. Centripetal force was it in a circular pack? The only force is the force of the bull on the bike. Yep, the bull on the bike, right? Which we would call a normal force. In this case, it's a normal force. Would it work very well to build that bowl out of paper mache or like cardboard? Why? It's not right. Was it, when you say it's not sturdy enough, that's exactly right. But what you mean is this doesn't provide a large enough normal force. And we know that, right? We innately know that if we were to build this out of wrapping paper, he would go straight through it. But what the physical reason for that is that the normal force would not be strong enough to provide a centripetal force. And so instead of going inward, he would just go in a straight line out, which he would feel as the fictitious force called centrifugal force. Good. When a soaring eagle turns during its flight, what is the source of the centripetal force acting on it? Air resistance. Air resistance is correct. So lots of things can provide the centripetal force. Remember, the centripetal force is a general name for any force acting towards the center of a circle. Um, but it can be provided by gravity or air resistance or friction or the normal force or the tensile force, all different kinds of forces can act as centripetal forces. Next question, please. Does centripetal force do work on a rotating object? Defend your answer. I said yes, because the centripetal force is any force that causes an object to follow a circle. Okay, what you said is correct, except for the very first part. So remember, there's a specific scientific definition of work. What is the scientific definition of work? What did we have to check out every single time we did the work calculation in physics? What did we have to ask ourselves first? Go back in your notes. Um, there was a there was a step zero when we did work equations. You can also check back in your book. I'll find the page number for you. And this is something that you we all kind of struggled with back when we did work um, in chapter eight. Oh, it's isn't it force times distance? It, that's the calculation is force times distance. But there's a special little caveat. There's a special circumstance that we have to check out first. Force and distance must be, how must they be related in the work equation? If you have a longer distance, the force will be smaller? Um, that's true of machines that, that keep the work the same. Uh, let's look, look, look with me at page 104, please. A, first of all, there's a nice picture of a guy in a singlet lifting weights. Um, it says, work done on an object by an applied force is the product of the force and the distance through which the object is moved. Do you remember both force and distance have to be what? Do you remember talking about this? It's not equal, is it? No, they don't have to be the same, but they have to be in the same. Let's go on. If we lift two loads up one story, are you with me? If we lift two loads up one story, we do twice as much work as we would in lifting one load of the same distance because the force needed to lift twice the weight is twice as great. So far, so good, right? Similarly, if we lift one load two stories instead of one story, we do twice as much work. So that's relating force and distance. But it says, notice that the definition of work involves both a force and a distance. A weightlifter holding a barbell weighing a thousand newtons over his head does no work on the barbell because it has to be in motion, right? It has to cover a distance. He may get really tired holding it, but if the barbell is not moved by the force he exert, he does no work. Does that, does that remind you of what it has to be? Force, force and distance for work have to be in the same direction. direction. There it is. Okay, so that's that's the extremely important. Let's go back, back to chapter eight now, and let's try again on, or sorry, chapter, back to chapter nine, and let's try again on that question. So it's asking, does centripetal force do work? What, act, what direction is the centripetal force acting? The towards the center. Is the object moving towards the center? No. So is it doing work? No. The distance it covers, is not in the same direction as the force. So centripetal force does not do scientific work. And what that means is that energy is not transferred from that object to the other, right? Because the force is not being applied in the same direction as the distance that is traveled. The book's simple answer is this. No, no component of force is in the direction of motion. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So remember, just you have to, I talked about this in the last chapter, you have to separate the scientific definition of work, which is force and distance in the same direction from your understanding 
meaning of work in a traditional sense, right? Like if I if I were to whirl that ball around my head, this the pantyhose ball of science, where did it go? Pantyhose ball of science. If I whirl this around my head for 35 minutes, I'm going to get tired, right? I'm doing work in the traditional sense, but the but my hand is not doing physical scientific work on the ball, right? Does that make sense? Because at any given point, if I pretend it's still moving, but if I pull it, if I stop it so we can like freeze frame, press, pretend it's still moving, the force is applied along the distance of the rope, right? And how does it actually move? This way. And so no, its distance is not in the same direction as its force. The force is inward, the distance it moves is around the circle. Okay? So scientific work is not done. Does that, is that clear? Okay, let's move on to the next one then. Mars is twice the distance from the sun is, is Venus. A Martian year, which is the time about which is the time it takes Mars to go around the sun, is about three times as long as a Venusian. Venusian. Venusian year. Which of these two planets has a greater rotational speed in its orbit? I thought Venus. Venus. Yeah, greater has greater rotational speed, right? Because what? It goes, it takes Mars longer. Yeah, the Mars does fewer rotations in the same amount of time, or sorry, fewer revolutions in the same amount of time. Okay, B. Which planet has the greater linear speed? Also put Venus. Also put Venus, good. So the linear speed comes out of Mars comes out to be two divided by three compared to Venus, right? Because it's, it only has twice the distance to go around or twice the radius, but it takes three times longer. So it's two thirds the linear velocity of Venus. Questions about that one? Okay, go on to the next one, please. To a turntable that turns ten revolutions each second is located on the top of a mountain. Mounted on the turntable is a laser that emits a bright beam of light. As the turntable and laser rotate, this beam also rotates and sweeps across the sky. Now hold up. I love this question. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about it. Have you did you envision this? It says so you have a turntable like a record player, which you have at your house, on top of a mountain, and it turns ten revolutions every second, right? That's that's totally reasonable. Okay, 10 revolutions each second, and it's on top of a mountain. And as it turns, the laser sweeps across the clouds. So far, so good, right? As the turntable and the laser rotate, the beam also rotates and sweeps across the sky. On a dark night, the beam reaches some clouds that are 10 kilometers away. All this is making like conceptual sense. Okay, you can visualize this in head, in your head. Hey, Haley, what did you put? Um, I wasn't too sure how to do this because I Would you read the question for A, please? Uh, how fast does this spot? of laser light sweep across the clouds. Okay, so we need to find what here? Linear velocity. Linear velocity. So how are we gonna find linear velocity? Which would be omega times radius. Yep, omega times radius. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have an omega, 10 revolutions each second, right? And radius equals five kilometers. Five kilometers. Well, it should be 10 kilometers because the clouds are that far away from the mountain. So 10 kilometers. And how many meters is that? How many meters is 10 kilometers? 10,000 10, meters, yeah. So we're gonna put in 10,000 meters for our radius. We're gonna put in what for our omega? 10. 10 revolutions per second, right? So 10 per second. And we're gonna come up with the value of 100,000 meters per second. Okay. How fast, it says, does the spot of laser sweep across some clouds? They're 20 kilometers away. What do you think? 200,000 200, meters per second. And then it says, at what distance will the laser beam sweep across the sky at the speed of light? And then it gives you the speed of light. In chapter 15, we've learned that no material can travel at the speed of light. Here we have a non-material spot. So this is what's so cool about this equation, or what's so cool about this question, is that it wouldn't take very far for these lights, well, I mean, it's, it's kind of far, but it wouldn't take very far for the clouds to be experiencing that beam sweeping across them faster than the speed of light, which we learn in chapter 15 is impossible. Nothing, no, no physical object can move faster than the speed of light, but here it's just a laser dot, and that laser dot can move faster than the speed of light. In fact, um, there's a kind of cool YouTube video that you can, well, you're on YouTube right now, you can look it up. It's, uh, Vsauce does one about 
um, an immaterial spot sliding across the surface of the moon. Like he imagines that you had a laser pointer strong enough that if you pointed it at the moon and you just move your hand a little bit, a little tiny bit, that laser spot would move across the whole surface of the moon in less than a second. And that obviously is faster than the speed of light. And so why is that possible? And the answer is this, is that immaterial spots like the laser dot or a shadow or something like that can move faster than the speed of light, but they're not made of anything, which I think is kind of cool. I th in fact, I think that's really cool. Do you have questions about that? Okay. Um, well, the other thing is that since that's revolutions are measured in radians, we need to multiply that by two pi. So actually those answers were 628, which is two times pi times your answer. So 628,000 and then 1,256,000. So 1,256,000 meters because we have to multiply it by two pi. Because one, you, you're in trigonometry, right? Yeah. Both of you. So one rotation is two pi radians. So we just have to multiply it by two pi also. So your math, you had a slight math there, but I'm not sure. Do we have to do that on test? Yeah, yeah. If, if the answer is given to you in something like revolutions or something, it has to be two pi times that, because that's how many radians. Because for the math to work out, we have to have it in radians, and one revolution is two pi radians. And I may have forgotten to mention that in the video and discussion. So hopefully you're watching this, Morgan, and you can write that down. The If it's given in revolutions, it needs to be two pi times that amount, because that gives it two in radians. Sorry, Haley, I think we have one more. Is that correct? Or is there two? Two more. Go ahead. Consider a two small space station that consists of a four meter radius rotation sphere. A man standing inside it is two meters tall, and his feet are at one gravity? Yeah, one G, one acceleration of gravity. What is the acceleration of his head? What's the answer to that one? So if, if his feet are at one G, and it's a four meter radius sphere, he's two meters tall, what is the relationship between his height and the radius of the sphere? Half, and so what would be the acceleration of gravity if it were half as far away from the center? Instead of one G, it would now be 0 0.5 G, good. Would that be comfortable, do you think, if you had a different acceleration of gravity at your head compared to your feet? No, in fact, your book, if you, if you read that part, your book says that it's okay, a human being can kind of like handle or doesn't matter to you if it's about a tenth of a G difference between your head and your feet, that's fine. Anything more than that, you'll get sick. Um, and I don't mean like you'll get a terminal disease, like you, it'll make you vomit, you'll get nauseous from having different accelerations. Um, but if it's less than a tenth of a G, you'll, you'll be okay. I don't even know, if, it doesn't say if you'll feel it or not, and I've obviously never experienced it, but it, you can handle a tenth of a G difference. And so it says, explain why rotating stru space structures need to be large. Well, because of what I just said, right? That you, you're, your body can only handle a fairly small difference in acceleration between your head and your feet. And so in order to make that difference smaller, we need to make the space station larger. Okay. Next one. Oh, wait, this one says one one hundredth of a G. Well, I guess what I, all I just said was wrong. One one hundredth of a G is what the very next problem says. So you can, you can handle one one hundredth of a G. Let me read this one aloud. Standing inside a rotating space station, your feet have a greater linear, sorry, your feet have a greater linear speed and a greater centripetal acceleration than your head, like we just said. We say there's a difference in G from your head to your feet, and this difference can be quite uncomfortable. Studies show, however, that a difference of one one hundredth of a G, forgive me, across the human body produces no discomfort. What then should be the radius of the space station compared to your height, so the difference in accelerations between your head and your feet is only one one hundredth of a G. This should be a fairly easy one to figure out. So we found in the last one that if you were half as tall as the radius of the space station, the difference was half a G. So how many times taller than you or how many times greater distance should the radius be compared to your height? 100 times. So if, if the average person will say is about 1.8 meters tall, but the tallest person, like we want Mr. Barry to be able to come along with us. And so we need to make it, we'll say he's two meters tall. If he's two meters tall, how, what should the radius of our space station be? Almost. We want it to be 100 times his height, so 200. You're thinking maybe of the diameter. The radius should be 200 meters. The diameter should be 400 meters. And then we can all walk around comfortably inside. Do you have questions about any of these? Do you have questions about the chapter in general? Okay, if you have questions, um, 
ask one of these girls or text them and have them ask me. I will see you. When will we? When we're going to be back tomorrow. Um, I, I think we're going to have the test tomorrow. So prepare for your test, study, rewatch your videos, look at your notes. Bye.